So I'm so excited that we have Guy Dehadne with us today. Guy's currently working as Vice President of Project Evaluation with the Cisco Gold Royalties and is on the Mining Technical Advisory and Monitoring Committee for the Canadian Securities Administrators. So prior to this, he worked for five years as an exploration geo at Extrata Nickel before transitioning to consulting work. He managed the SGS Geostat team for several years, working on a wide range of projects internationally, from resource estimations, economic evaluations, geometallurgical studies, and audits of resources and reserves. So with his expertise, I'm really excited to hear from him today about how cognitive biases are crippling the mining industry. So it is gonna be a great session. I hope you all enjoy it. And yes, thank you so, so much, Guy, for joining. It's just wonderful having you. Thanks everybody for being here. This is a, uh, I, I would like to thank the traditional peoples of where I am, but I can't reveal that without revealing where I am. Actually, I'm in a hotel room uh, somewhere uh, on, a, on a project evaluation. So my job is to, uh, to evaluate projects, uh, I, um, which is a very fun, fun thing to do. And if I do my job well, I identify the dogs very quickly. So. There's a little fun image of dogs and food and very, very confusing. Uh, at first pass, everything looks looks great and delicious until uh, you spot the dogs in here. And uh, it, from my experience, um, the, the majority of projects are less good than they are marketed as. And, um, and oftentimes they're just purely uneconomic. Between the ASX and the Toronto Stock Exchange, there's, there's close to 2,000 exploration companies uh, that are touting the, the best next best project. And as, as you can expect, uh, most of them are, are not that great. So my, my, my company uh, wants to invest in some of these projects and my job is to figure out which ones are, are viable and which ones are not. Um, I did a uh, sort of a, a compilation of all of the uh, feasibility studies uh, that have been published over the years and plotted them in a histogram. So uh, IRR is, is uh, basically the profitability of projects. And generally speaking, people want to have a project with a, a greater than 20% at IRR, which is sort of like an artificial threshold of what's a great project. And there's an artificial amount of projects that fall, you know, across this, this boundary. And this is, you know, due to the fact that people are using optimistic assumptions to try to make their project look, look better than it is in reality. Uh, I'm, I am a geologist. My background has been exploration and resource estimation. I, uh, I'm an optimist by, uh, by nature in the, in the way that I'm a, because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a geologist, I always see potential where, uh, where others can't see it. But this talk is very, very fast. Uh, cynical view of, of the industry to try to get people to, to look at the, the broader picture and see how we can increase um, the viability or reduce the, the, the capital destruction that the industry as a whole uh, has, uh, has been doing over the past few decades. So um, we've seen in Canada, we've had you know, four fairly high profile projects, mostly gold. Uh, gold is harder to estimate and put into production than base metals in general, just from the, the, uh, uh, the chemical and geometric complexity of those, those deposits. And oftentimes after uh, a project has failed, uh, investors point to the management and the management turns around and says, listen, it's the rocks are more complicated than we, than we thought. It's the rocks fault. So this is a, this is a, a sign that I saw in Colombia, which, which sort of angers me because it's a, it's a road cut that is dangerous and the way it's described and on the sign is like, be careful, the rocks are dangerous. Whereas like, obviously it's the humans that decided to put the road where it is and design it in an unfortunate way, that's the problem. Um, I'm, I'm on a, a couple committees to try to make recommendations to changes on the NI43-101 and also the management of, of some, of the, some of the Canadian uh, securities agencies. Uh, and this is something that I keep coming back to is like, we need to, 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 to increase uh, the reliability of what we do as an industry and, and fundamentally part of the problem is, is the humans making the decision. So that's at the core of what we want to talk about. And my biggest pet peeve and what I think is at the core of a lot of, a large portion of the, uh, the failed projects that we see in, in mining is, is due to this workflow. 
gold gold projects are are uh, difficult to delineate properly. Drilling is expensive, so we want to minimize the number of drill holes. Um, some deposits are very simple, nice big potatoes. The proportion of assays within the, the potato is is above cutoff grade, so there's very little chance that you fail at, at making a model around what's ore and waste. But in many cases, the, the geometry of the deposits is, is more complex and it's very difficult to make a, a, a watertight solid around what's ore to separate the waste and the ore. And if you don't separate those at the very beginning, then the rest of your steps, as, as we saw a few weeks ago when Lucy Potter gave her presentation, are all for none. You need to understand what is the control on, on the ore. And also if you don't separate ore from waste and you're also violating the future geostatistics that you're going to uh, do to, to sort of uh, as, as a tool for interpolation, but also as a measure of the confidence on your estimation. So oftentimes what we see is people make an attempt to make a nice clean ore solid that defines ore and waste. Uh, they fail because the deposit is too complicated compared to the drilling that they have. And then by the nature, the very nature of resource estimation, it's, it's a, it's a, the mechanisms are basically averaging. So you go from a distribution. So in the top histogram here is a distribution of raw assays or mineralized intervals within the, that ore solid. And there's a huge amount of zeros here because you did a crappy job of making the ore solid. And it's a, it's a logarithmic distribution. So you have lots of super high grade values. And again, as you're making the, the block model and the resource estimation, you're sort of averaging. So you're, you're changing a bunch of those zeros into non-zeros and you're going towards making a bell curve and dragging a bunch of the blocks into uh, a higher value. And on average, both of these histograms, if you just take the mean of them, they're very close to each other. But because we're applying an artificial cutoff grade, then it actually creates a higher number of blocks above the cutoff than is in reality. And then because we violated the first law of geostatistics in terms of let's keep populations uh, that are internally consistent separate and that we're describing one population of data, uh, we violated that. So the variogram then becomes totally useless and doesn't give us any real information. So this is a real variogram that we used, was used to classify resources in one of the, the failed Canadian projects that, that, I, that I'm describing. Uh, and then this gives people a clue. So there's a 400 meter range here. And this was used as a, to describe a uh, continuity within the deposit, which, which was clearly, clearly wrong. And in general, in the industry, people spend too much uh, time talking about the grade unpredictability uh, and not enough time thinking about the geometric unpredictability. So a lot of the geostats that we use in the industry it comes from people that worked on very huge deposits and those huge deposits tend to be porphyries or, or other potato shaped internally consistent mineralization types. So that's sort of like the Bible is like, this is how we uh, create our estimations, this is how we make our assumptions and then this is how we do the classification. But that falls apart when you look at deposits like orogenic gold deposits, which, which are you know the most common uh, ASX or TSX listed company is either sulfide deposits or orogenic deposits, in which case you need to really consider like where does physically, geometrically, where does ore start and where does ore end. And you, you, there's no geostatistical tool that's, that's very useful to define that risk and also to uh, define what is a, a reasonable classification scheme. So I'm going to leave that behind, but that's my biggest pet peeve in the world. Uh, this is a, is a, is a real uh, case study. So uh, just going to read through some of the, uh, and I've sort of altered the wording here a little bit to, to hide what the project is. But um, so this is from a recent uh, technical report somewhere in the world. Gold grade has a skewed distribution where the high grade component is proportionally low in number. Mineralization tends to occur in thin, discontinuous sheets or lenses of mineralization. Individual lenses of gold mineralization pinch and swell, which makes the modeling modeling the zones exceedingly difficult. Dozens of attempts at automating wireframe constructions were not satisfactory. So just reading those, those few parts, you're like, okay, I've, I've learned something about the deposit. And what, a, what an unbiased person would say is like, okay, this is a risky deposit. We need to take extra steps when we're estimating. 
Uh, number one, this thing probably needs more drilling than usual. We know it's discontinuous. Uh, we need to try very hard, even though you know there were attempts made to make a solid, we need to try very hard to sort of define and separate ore from waste. Otherwise, we're going to smear the grade and make tons where they don't belong. Geostatics, geostatics, geostatistics are going to be unreliable because, again, we don't, we can't make a separate population of ore versus waste. It's two separate populations that are mixed, so we need to be careful of that. Uh, capping needs to be conservative, and we need a sanity check on what the mineable shapes are going to be. So it's one thing to estimate a big global resource, which is close to reality, but it's another thing to estimate a block model, which has a shape that you can actually select in 3D and, and decide what you're going to mine versus what you're going to leave behind. So that's what a rational person would say. And this is what actually happens. So the, the uh, shit sandwich of a project here, they used uh, 80, 80 grams per ton capping, no real ore model, and 50 meter drill spacing for probable reserves. So just as a, as a rule of thumb in, in the industry, often operating mines use around 25 meters. Obviously, it varies widely, but to me, this is these are these are assumptions that are going to lead to an overestimation and uh, and a classification that's far too strong. And at the base of this, I was the, the people that are doing this work. They're not bad people. They don't want to do harm. They're just trying to do their job. So, what is it bringing them to make these these poor poor decisions? And, and it always comes back to me is like, there, there's human factors here that we need to take into consideration. And one of the definitions or the, what we're gonna to explore today is the cognitive bias. So it's just, it's, it's a systematic error in thinking that occurs when people are processing and interpreting information in the world around them. So our brain is not perfectly rational and we are affected by the people around us, by the, our environment, uh, which often causes us to make the un unrational decision which in geology or mining can lead to, to bad uh, decisions. So if you want to go down a rabbit hole, uh, you can Google cognitive biases. There's, there's literally hundreds of them, and I've just picked a smattering of them. So I'm not a psychologist. I've never taken a psych course or anything, but there's, there's so many of these, and a lot of them are going to apply to mining or geology and exploration. Uh, but again, this is just a sampling of ones that I, that I recognize like directly like, oh, in my experience, this is something that, that can affect. Uh, a fairly important one is the IKEA effect. So the IKEA effect speaks to how we tend to like things more if we've expended effort to create them. Um, managers fall in love with their projects and will do things to make sure that the projects continue. They, their, their life is attached to the success of, of that project. Um, and this is, I mean, I'm sure this is not just in, the, in mining, it's, it's in everything, right? So I, I found this really intriguing example. So uh, recently uh, there was a profile on, on this uh, Nubar Afeyan here. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur and his business model is thinking of new moonshot, like big risk, but big reward types of ideas. And then he approaches his experts and says, like, hey, how, why does my big idea not work? And then he has a list of, let's say, five things. It doesn't work because uh, he was trying to make a vaccine based on RNA, <clears throat> mRNA. And he said, like, no, the, uh, the body will reject it. Uh, you need to fold the RNA in a very specific way. There's no way to manufacture. He's like, OK, I'll take those problems back and I'll see if I can't solve them. And if I can't solve them, then I kill it and I move on to another big idea. Um, and he wants to kill the project, kill the idea as quickly as he can so he can put the capital where, where it belongs. And he refuses to, to name these, these ideas. And this, this mRNA idea, he named the company LS18 because he doesn't want to get personally attached to it. LS stands for life sciences and 18 is the 18th idea in life sciences that he had. Well, eventually he did solve the problems of folding of of our mRNA, of you know the body rejecting it, and how you mass produce these things, uh, and it's the foundation of Moderna. So this is in complete opposition to how junior exploration companies are built. Right, junior exploration companies are built with: I have a mine conceptually. I'm going to name this thing a fancy name. I have a beautiful, shiny website. I'm going to make videos. I'm going to have. Uh, VR sessions and like I'm going to make this thing super personal my friends are involved and everything 
And once you get, you've, you've built sort of that, that moat of like emotional attachment to, to a company, then it's really hard to, to let it die. And if you think about, you know, uh, in my experience, I used to work for, for Falcon Bridge, which, which is now defunct. It's now part of, uh, of Glencore, but their, their exploration criteria was, was, was very simple. For nickel, it was you need to find 20 million tons of 2% nickel. So if they found a new geological idea, it would be like, hey, let's go out and test it. Let's say they got a hit of interesting nickel mineralization. And then they would say, okay, let's drill six holes, step out 200 meters in every direction. If we don't hit on at least three of them, then we know for sure that this thing is not 20 million times. And then they walk away. So it's like, we, we have our idea, we test it, we, we try to kill it. And then if it doesn't work, then we move on to the, to the next opportunity. And I think like in the junior exploration market, we're, we're sort of thinking of, about that in the opposite way. I mean, it's working, it's been working for a long time, but it creates a lot of companies of managers that are emotionally attached to their project and will, will sort of force themselves and the people around them to get to some optimistic results based on that. Um, the next bias that I'd like to talk about is authority bias. Uh, which is the tendency to attribute greater weight uh, to the opinion of authority figures. And the second one here is courtesy bias, which is just like trying to be polite. Like we're, as humans, we're programmed to try not to get into to, to, uh, conflicts with people and we'll try to appease situations with, with just being quiet and polite and letting things evolve. Uh, super great book here by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, and he goes through a very specific case study. So this is not a, a mining case study, but it illustrates so perfectly um, the extreme case of, of authority bias. So it's a Colombian airline. Uh, Colombia is, is known for having an extremely hierarchical society, like you'd never talk against your boss. And if you're, if you're at this level, then you have to be always um th there's an expectation that you're 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 you need to be more quiet and listen and 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 uh, and i've experienced this uh, personally with uh in some uh, mining uh situations in, in my life so in this case the, the it's an extremely strange case because they were landing at in jfk airport and they crashed they ran out of fuel literally kilometers from the airport and they went back and listened to, you know, did they, did they run out of fuel because there was a problem with the fuel or something? And that they came back to only human factors. And the, the main factors were, and if you, if you watch, if you're a fan of these plane crash uh, documentaries, this is, is, is typical. There's several factors occurring at the same time. But at the core, the, the, the main pilot, who was like the super boss and needed to be respected, was extremely tired and was unaware of what was going on. And he was counting on the co-pilot to make decisions. The co-pilot was rather timid and was not sort of forcefully telling the pilot, like, dude, we are running out of fuel. We need this is an emergency. Uh, he was not telling the, uh, air, the flight control, like, we need to be at the front of the line. We're going to crash within a minute. It's very, if you listen to the, to the conversations and if you listen to the, to the audio book or if you Google this, you'll find the YouTube video, you can hear it from the, the tone of his voice is just like not enough of an emergency and sort of like trying not to shake up the, the authority figure on the plane. Uh, and eventually by the time he, he forced people to realize it was an emergency that, that there was a plane crash. And the geological or mining example of that is, is basically the, for me, it's the, the, the classic client uh, consultant relationship where the client is in a situation who wants to help the, the, the exploration company or the mining company uh, do well. And often the, the management of the company is very forceful or not, they don't even need to be forceful. They just need to be an authority figure and suggest either calmly or, or very strongly that you know, we should be assuming higher metallurgical recovery or a lower cutoff rate or a deeper pit or, or things like that. And oftentimes that happens. And, you know, I worked as a, as a consulting, as a consultant, and I've been in, in situations where there was pressure, either direct or indirect. Um, and oftentimes the, the, the client assumed that there was a, you know, we can assume, we can negotiate and find a middle ground and find a good solution to, uh, to make the project look better. Um, the next 
bias is called commitment bias. So it's a tendency to keep commitments to avoid reputational damage. So there's a truck here trying to get under the tunnel and why stop now you're halfway there. Um, I think we've, we've the, the, the geological example of this is we have a, we have a budget, we're, we have 15 kilometers of drilling. You know, we told all the investors, we got, we got this great target, we're gonna drill 15 kilometers. And after maybe two or three holes, you realize like, this is not at all what we thought. It's a lot thinner. In reality, it's a, it's a flat thing and there's no depth to it. And we were fooled. Uh, but I think all too often people go through and, and spend the money either because there's commitments to, to do it uh, rather than saying like, hey, we're, we're just going to stop. You know, we, we have enough information. Let's press pause and let's find a better target on the property or let's spend this money on another property. Uh, but, you know, we've, we're committed to it. So let's go through with it. And so this is often a, uh, uh, a, uh, a waste or a destruction of capital. And I'm sorry for people that have uh, young girls at home. Now you're, you've got this song stuck in your head. And uh, so, so this is it's a little bit depressing, this this part here. But I think it's an extremely good example of the the, the, ext the extreme of of how we can be uh, influenced uh, from the authority um, bias. So this is the Milgram experiment. It was basically a psychologist who, after looking at the Nuremberg trials uh, from the, the Nazi uh, concentration camps, he's like, "How is it possible that they have, we have a hundred German soldiers, these are not all psychopaths. These are all people that grew up in good neighborhoods from good parents. And they were able to uh, go work at Auschwitz and do these horrible, terrible things. Like what is it in the human condition that makes this possible? So he's, he set out doing this experiment. So essentially he had on one side of the room, uh, three actors. So one is, is attached to some electrodes and there's some dudes in lab coats that look very authoritative, like I'm a serious, I'm a serious scientist and I'm, I'm here to do an experiment. And then they have a test subject who's just some, some random person. And the exercise is essentially the actor needs to look at a text, memorize a certain things. And if he gets it wrong, he gets electrocuted. So this is actually quite similar to, there's a scene in Ghostbusters where we're uh, very similar to this, where he's, he's having fun electrocuting people. But, um, and they were, and then essentially like, as the experiment goes on and on, he, the, the, the guy in the lab coat keeps saying to the test subject, like, okay, now you get it wrong, go up, go up the scale. Right. And the top of the scale essentially suggests like, this could be deadly, deadly electrocution. And the actor is not getting electrocuted. He's just reacting like, ah, and in far too many cases, this, the test subject went to, to a very high intensive shock. So he, this is just a normal person, not a psychopath, but he's willing in this, in this scenario because there's a serious person in a, in a lab coat telling him things like, please continue, please go on. The experiment requires you to continue. It's absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice, you must go on. And this test subject was willing to cause pain to this other person in that situation which was very shocking and even the the psychologist admitted later like I, I didn't want to publish this thing because it made me too sad about what hum the human condition so this is an extreme case but I mean it just shows that how easily we can be affected and 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 make decisions that in if you zoom out look look terrible and, and like why would I even do that but in the situation could be thought of um the compromise effect, I think, is uh, is uh, is a tendency to choose the middle option. So this is if you go to a, a French restaurant or any restaurant, oftentimes what the the menu is set out in a way the the wine menu, for example, is set out in a way to make you buy a certain bottle of wine. So generally, people will not buy the cheapest bottle because they don't want to seem cheap with their date. So they they sort of like put a bottle at twelve dollars and one at eighteen dollars, and that eighteen dollar bottle of wine is the one they actually want to sell you. And it's just like our human human mind is like, I'm going to go for that for that middle option. And in the mining scenarios, often we're 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 faced when we're looking at assumptions. Like if the consultant or the client or the employee and his manager are like, you know, we we should choose this assumption for let's say the the mining cost for the open pit scenario, and the manager says, no, no, let's use a lower cost to make a bigger pit. And we'll just pick one in the middle, and that middle option is like has not no rational reasoning behind it, but 
oftentimes that's what happens just because we want to placate to um, to the client or to the boss to, to just move on and, and go on to the next things. But uh, if you do the middle option on, you know, 15 of the, the 17 different assumptions that go into an economic study, then the, the, the sum of all those minor changes in the study is not just linear. It, it, some of these stack up in a, in a, in a exponential way and, and can cause a, a projects to look way better than they do in reality. Uh, the construal effect is a tendency to view events in the future in terms of a high level of benefit. In contrast, I think in the events sooner in time, the level of effort diminishes the attractiveness. So here I've shown a uh, oldie, oldie style a coffee maker and a go-kart and Elon Musk is like, oh, geez, it's going to be easy to make this uh, cyber truck here. And obviously it's taking him a lot longer to do. Uh, and the geological uh, version of this could be, you know, an experimental here I'm giving the example of extracting uh, lithium from clays seems plausible. So if you're if you're looking at a, a clay deposit, you're like, yeah, hey, yeah, we'll we'll figure it out. This is uh, there's a reasonable prospect that of economic extraction of the lithium from these clays. If you're thinking about it like in the far future, but if it's like, no, no, we we, we need to develop this for now. It's like, oh, geez, we need. There's a lot of work that needs to go into uh, solving this for for immediately. Uh, the street light effect occurs when people only search for something where it's easiest to look. So uh, the police officer here says, uh, is this where you lost your wallet? He's like, no, no, I, I lost it in the park. This is this is where the light is. Um, and I've got a couple examples here. So uh, this is a, the a deposit in Quebec called Veza. Uh, and these three, we're looking sort of at a, a long section uh, the, the exact same block model, three different ways, but I'm just applied a different cutoff gray. So red is ore and gray is waste. And uh, the, the one on the left is set at a three, three gram per ton cutoff grade. And the one on the right is set at a five gram per ton cutoff. Um, so oftentimes people come to a new project and they have a, a, um, a preset sort of expectation of what the project can deliver. So instead of looking at like, okay, what, what can this geological deposit actually deliver me? Be like, I need this to work at a five gram per ton cutoff and we'll sort of force that economic scenario on the project. But if you actually look in detail, the continuity at this cutoff grade becomes so shredded that there's, there's very little chance that you could selectively mine and make, you know, rectangular stopes out of out of, out of this effect. So the question shouldn't be like, can I make five gram per ton cutoff work? You should go back and say like, what is what is the highest cutoff grade that this deposit can reasonably deliver? And then test, test that to the end and, and it's possible that this deposit is not economic. Uh, another example of the street light effect is, is in Australia, uh, this is an example of Falcon Mills, which was was uh, was just spun out from Chalice, and these guys uh, made a Julemar deposit discovery, and they had this other concept of looking underneath uh, the cover around the Fosterville uh, deposit, and like there's no reason why the geologists doesn't continue up there. Uh, and similarly in Canada, there's a group called like, Kenorland who who picked up huge swaths of land that are underneath uh, glacial till, which there's nothing to see on surface. There's maybe you know less than one percent outcrop, but the geology is equally good there. It's just harder to look for it. So, you know these are these are belts of rocks that have been overlooked because it's just too hard to, to go look there. But I mean, if we're going to find uh, new big deposits, then then we need to start looking at not where where the light is, but where uh, the potential could be, and just you need to work a little bit harder to to get them. Uh, the anchoring effect is an individual's decisions are influenced by a particular reference uh, reference point, regardless of whether it is valid. So um, this is actually this, one of the, the examples that I've discussed previously here. Uh, these are the resources, the ounces of resources at the single deposit done by four different competent persons or QPs in Canada uh, over time. So the, the 2011 version is 4 million ounces at of inferred resources. And now we know that this person was a, not necessarily a fraud, but was not competent in his work. And this number should never have been used as a reference. Uh, but in 20, later that year, uh, 
a respected three letter consultant firm uh, redid the resources and reduced it considerably to you know less than three million ounces. A couple of years later, the company had done you know tens of kilometers of drilling and another a totally separate three letter respected consulting firm came in here and did uh, 2.5 million ounce reserves, so like resources. So reduced it again from 4 million to 2.5. And I'm sure in the conversations between the client and, and the consultants in these cases, uh, we're forcefully trying to convince the, the competent persons to like, how could you do this to me? Uh, we need, you know, I had 4 million ounces two years ago. How could you cut my resources? We spent all this money on drilling. So they built, they were able to finance the project based on this on this 2013 data. They spent $400 million Canadian to build a mine. Uh, and then when they got underground, they realized there was no gold there, not as much as they thought. So they stopped everything. They redid the resource estimation and they came out with the number. So the 2013 and 2016 numbers are from the same, same consulting firm. And they were down to close to 400,000 ounces. So, the initial assessment was exaggerated by 10 times, 1,000% essentially. But that number was sort of as a fake reference was, was in the back of the mines and maybe forcefully put to the front of the mines by the client uh, as a number, which had absolutely no, no benefit to the, to the project. It was just complete garbage and totally misleading. Um, so this to me is like anchoring effect is, is, uh, is something that's real and, uh, is, is dangerous because we, we just hang on to a number. The first number that you say is, is a number that you, you can be influenced to, uh, to use, uh, survivorship bias. I think this, this image comes up on LinkedIn about every two weeks. So this is a, um, World War II, uh, engineer was, was charged with, looking at where to add armor on these uh, planes uh, to protect them from, from, uh, from gunfire from, from the ground, from the Germans. And so he started accumulating all the, the bullet holes from the planes that would come back. And he sort of made this beautiful diagram or a version of it to show like, you know, these are, these are where our planes are getting shot. And some people were like, oh, that's great. Now we can put more armor in those places. But the reality is, the, the places that we should protect these planes are is the opposite of where the red dots are because the, the planes that got shot in, in the cockpit or in the engines or in the other parts of the plane are actually planes that didn't come home, right? The, the planes that came back that he's taking a sample of is artificially opposite of what he wants, right? He's looking for the planes that he didn't have access to the planes that got shot down. Um, and so, uh, a good example of this in, in geology is, is when, I, when I worked for, as a consulting firm, I worked for SGS, which is, a, which is one of the big lab companies. And every once in a while, a client would be like, oh, geez, I had this high grade de uh, gold deposit. It's nuggety. It probably has coarse gold. Maybe I'll get more gold, higher assays if I use screen metallics, which is a, an assay method, which basically screens out and looks for, for coarser nuggets, which are missed or missed in uh, typical assays. And the problem is oftentimes what would happen is um, the, the uh, let me just explain this graph first. So essentially this is a uh, cumulative frequency plot. So if you take every single assay within the project and just put them in order, bigger to bigger to bigger. And the black line in the center is the real true perfect assay value of, of each one of those samples. But in reality, because of nugget effect and errors in estimation, errors of, of uh, sample preparation, the, the value that you actually measure from each sample can vary, can vary quite a bit in the range that I've shown in the red arrows. So the truth is on the black line and what you actually measure in your assay is, is beyond that. So typically what happens is the, the, the client would go back and say, like, oh, I'm going to go back and sample my highest grade assays. So by doing that, the the, the, the samples that are selected from this artificial cutoff grade, just like the planes coming back from, from, from battle that, are, that survived getting shot by the Germans was artificial. In this case, 
you're artificially selecting samples that on average are were accidentally higher than the true value. So if when you resample samples in this red domain, you're more likely to get samples that are actually lower grade. So then the results of the screen metallics test comes back and they have 100 samples and the majority of them are lower than the initial assays and then this the pandemonium because the client's like, what's, what's wrong with my assays? Like, which ones are correct? Why are my, my high grade assays all low now? But I mean, the fact, the fact that he had, he or she had selected above a, a certain cutoff grade to start with sort of set up for, for failure. Um, the framing effect is uh, essentially just how we describe data where we, we see more pain when it's a loss. So I don't know if you guys remember McDonald's had a burger, a low fat burger, and they, they claimed it was 91% fat free, but they tried to uh, put it as 9% fat free instead. And it was a, it was a big flat out to, to think that 9% of my burgers fat is, seems gross, but 91% of it seems okay. But, it's, uh, it's just the way that our brains are taking into data. And in terms of mining, I think the, the equivalent would be when we give uh, economic results of projects, we usually give a single value. So we'll give the NPV, and the NPV is $250 million. Like it's, it's a single number. There's no variability around it. But many people are sort of uh, looking or pushing for people to do more simulations and more variability around all the different assumptions. So the price assumptions, the metallurgical recovery, and all these different assumptions that go into the, the study. And in reality, we don't have a single value that can be, can be done. There's, there's a, a variety of values. And I've, I, I love this idea. I'm like, yeah, of course there's uncertainty. Like, why, why are we assuming it's $250 million? This thing could lose money. We have a lot of mines that fail because, because of various reasons. Like, why can't we accept that? And when I propose this to people, they're generally like, no, I don't want to show, I can't show my investors or my boss. We have, you know, 20% chance that we're going to lose money. But like, in reality, this, this, this is what it is, but we, we don't want to be able to, to show those, those outcomes. So the solutions to, I mean, this is, this is really, really hard. And I'm going to ask you guys to sort of chime in and, and see if there's any easy solutions. But first of all, you know, we need to understand that a lot of our decisions are not rational. Uh, we need to question our motivations. And when we're selecting uh, assumptions or making what seem like small decisions on things that get built up into a final product, uh, it's good to slow down and really question uh, what are our motivations to, to sort of make those, those decisions. Uh, and just before we go into questions, uh, I have some lists of books that are like down the down the center of, of this uh, human human fragility or or how we think or how we should think differently. And so if you guys are interested, I can send those to you uh, separately. But I'd love to hear what you guys think uh, about uh, about the discussion, if there's any interesting solutions out there to, to help us do better in the future. Thank you so much. That was so interesting.